Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. I am Billy Embody. Thanks for joining me today. We've got to, of course, talk about Pac-12 media rights deals and realignment and rumors and all of those things. And we're going to get to that right away. We will break down some of the biggest uh, position battles SMU faces in spring practice as well uh, as we get through this podcast and some of your Mailbag questions from our OnThePonyExpress.com subscribers will be answered as far as realignment goes as we share the latest on Pac-12 realignment, which continues to dominate all the headlines around SMU. So let's jump in. News broke from the New York Post that Apple is also involved now in the media rights negotiations, uh, throwing an interesting wrench into what was mainly believed to be an Amazon and ESPN discussion going on with the league. Now, how interested is Apple? Kind of remains to be seen, but look, this is a platform with Apple TV that does have an MLS contract um, and certainly is getting into the sports realm. And Amazon is as well. You know, they jumped into the NFL side of things. They're looking for inventory, ESPN Plus, um, and ESPN has certainly been uh, involved with its own streaming platform, as well as that late night Pac-12 after dark time slot, which is around 10.30 p.m. Eastern time. And look, I think my re initial reaction to Apple being involved now is that this is what you want, but it also points towards maybe a deal isn't as close as people are thinking. You know, Washington State's president was quoted as mid-March is the dead, not in the deadline, but the um likely time frame that he's expecting something to get done. And these must have been conversations that have been ongoing for him to have said something like that. Uh, conversations ongoing with Amazon, ESPN, Apple. Um, we've seen some of the other networks be ruled out as far as Pac-12 media rights deal goes. Um, but if you're Apple, um, you look at this as an opportunity to get into college sports and a West Coast tie that you certainly have um, with Apple's campus being in California. I think this is something that with the Pac-12 could be beneficial to their media rights deal negotiation. It's really a matter of now, if this is the case where it's Apple and Amazon, who wants it more? Who wants to be involved with college sports and get this inventory for your uh, streaming platform? And what does that look like? How much is free? How much is uh, tied into maybe an Apple plus subscription or an Amazon Prime uh, sub subscription. That is all uh, some of the questions I would at least have is what does it look like? What gives the league the best opportunity to have exposure and to certainly make some waves on the front of uh, their media rights deal? Because as they likely go into a heavy streaming based media rights deal, exposure is one of the, the discussions going on. But I'll tell you, look, Streaming is certainly something that is still very much um, finding its way when it comes to uh, the platforms that you can uh, watch on and how the inventory is on those platforms. For example, I have YouTube TV. Yes, it's technically streaming when it comes to just going straight to the internet, but it is very much a TV guide of sorts uh, feel to it. Apple, Amazon, we saw Amazon have a little bit of a tie-in when I watched the NFL on their Thursday night game to my provider, YouTube TV, making it very easy to watch that game on the platform. How does Apple, how does Amazon expand on that to allow fans the easiest access to its games? That's going to be something that I'm sure the conference has questions about uh, because this is something that you've got to keep in mind. The fans um, are the ones that are going to drive your ability to have a higher ceiling as far as how much money you're going to get out of this deal because long-term, you want them to be watching your games and viewership is something that's going to be really, really looked at over the course of whatever deal the Pac-12 signs in terms of length because when it's time to negotiate that next round, will it be a bump up? Will it be viewed as a failure? Will they need to go in a different direction? Those are some of the things I'm I'm watching now. As it stands for SMU and San Diego State, those are still the two favorites to join the Pac-12. Uh, one quick note, uh, Fresno State is now a school that is 
uh, or yeah, Fresno State has kind of been in discussion here and there with the Big 12 as well, um, which is in, an interesting tidbit that came out this week. But the biggest thing that remains on the docket for people watching realignment and expansion in the Pac-12's case is this media rights deal. And uh, talking with people, I am in walking in line with Washington State's president who has circled kind of that um, mid-March area for an announcement to come. There seems to be confidence, uh, especially coming from him uh, when it comes to the future of the league and all of the things the president's have been saying to each other, sticking in line with each other, not leaving the league. He doesn't see you know programs leaving like the four corner schools going to the Big 12. I don't see that right now either. Um, we had a question on our board about when the new Big 12 commissioner will be announced. Well, uh, they just hired a search firm about two weeks ago to lead that. So it does seem like that process, once Kevin Warren leaves, I believe in April, uh, will be ongoing for the next couple months as they try to find the next leader of that conference. That can slow down any sort of buzz, I would say, around Oregon and Washington leaving. And I honestly haven't heard too much about that because, look, when it comes to the Big Ten grabbing USC and UCLA, those were your big fish. Those were your massive needle movers when it comes to expansion and realignment uh, that – you know, Kevin Warren was able to convince and say, hey, this is going to be a massive deal. Let's get this done and let's help each other out um, in the in that respect. And they certainly have benefited from that with the new Big Ten media rights deal getting in place. But with Oregon and Washington, it's a little bit of a murkier situation. How much value do they add? Does it become something where uh, the new media rights deal needs money added to it? That's probably a possibility if they were to leave. Uh, for the Big Ten. But one thing of note, you know, the Big Ten media rights deal is a lot of money. That's a lot of money being spent um, by their media partners already on the schools involved. Could they stretch it even more? That'd be a big question that I would have in terms of any potential move from Oregon and Washington happening. And I feel like right now things are fairly settled in the Pac-12. And believe it or not, despite this media rights deal not being announced, there's a lot of, I would say, alignment. Maybe a school here or there that doesn't necessarily agree with some of it or some of the decisions. I mean, you know, Arizona is a school that supported SMU in this. Arizona State, on the flip side, has been kind of a thorn in the side of expansion uh, when it comes to the Pac-12. But in the end, the majority of the schools, the vast majority of them, are in alignment. And that's why you saw uh, that unity statement, whatever you saw or whatever you thought about it, uh, you know, the Washington state president really uh, hammered it down as far as, you know, look, they knew they were going to get feedback. They felt it was important that they release that statement and it moved quickly. So there are a lot of conversations being had around the PAC 12, uh, their future. And, you know, when it comes to this media rights deal, and I try to, you know, look at what's happening and Apple seemingly coming out of nowhere for this deal um, was asked on the board by K money do I think Apple will be in the Pac-12 media deal? Right now, I'm going to say no. I'm sti sticking with Amazon and ESPN. There's certainly buzz around Apple right now because the news just broke. They've been uh, dipping their toe in the sports water. But on the same, same side of things, the buzz has consistently been around e Amazon and ESPN. So if that's the case, I think those are farther along. It doesn't mean th that Apple can't get a deal done. Um, and if they did, it would probably be a beneficial thing for the Pac-12 in terms of money. So that is kind of a wild card now that Apple has been reportedly involved with negotiations uh, as far as the Pac-12 media rights deal. Um, we talked about it and, and others have reported this. A lot of people were watching to see if George Klyovkov had a rabbit in his hat to pull out when it comes to this media rights deal. And that would certainly be that rabbit would be Apple paying up for the Pac-12 media rights deal um, and probably involving someone like an like an ESPN with that late night game um, and certainly, you know, some some ESPN plus content as well. Uh, another question comes in from uh, Fountain Connoisseur. Uh, would our Olympic sports move conferences as fast as football and basketball? I would say yes. I think this is a move that you don't see split conferences very often. I would be... Um, I would have to double check that across the board, but 
in terms of splitting conferences, it's just not something at the power five level, especially that you see. So I think it would all happen all at once. Um, you know, if SMU did get invited and join the Pac-12 this spring, when would they enter this coming from SMU alum 11? Uh, I would say 2024. It all depends on what this, um, you know, buyout looks like from the American in terms of what they agree on. Obviously, we've seen Houston, Cincinnati, and UCF agree to one as well to leave early. And they are now, now out. Um, you know, I feel like that's one where if you're SMU, you're trying to strike while, while the iron's hot. That's a situation where I feel like SMU would have the money raised fairly quickly to make it in time for the 2024 season. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, everything else around Pac-12 realignment, um, this is one where people ask about, is the expansion going to be ready in time if they do join the Pac-12 for the 2024 season? Yes, the Weber end zone complex is expected to be done August 2024. Um, and finally, a question from SMU. Giddy up, what do you feel might be the most surprising, good and bad, parts of joining a Power 5 conference for SMU and fans? On the fan side of things, um, as far as surprising goes, I think they're going to enjoy, if they do get into the Pac-12, this group of schools. I mean, it's it's anywhere from Arizona, Arizona State, beautiful places to go check out, a lot of fun out there. You've got Colorado, which obviously... You know, not to play into some stereotypes, but a lot of SMU, SMU people do get out uh, to Colorado to go skiing. You certainly have uh, not that as much in football season, but you do have those ties out there. Um, and then you have some really cool places to visit. And quite frankly, when it comes to DFW, it seems like to me, I've probably met people that have gone to every single college in the Pac-12 by this point uh, that live out here and there's a good contingent and they have watch parties already. We'll toss them on SMU's campus whenever their school comes to town. I think it would be really, really cool and 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 a lot of fun, uh, quite honestly. I think that's the thing that people will be somewhat surprised about is how much fun uh, could be had with this group of schools uh, in the Pac-12 and, and if SMU joined the league. As far as the bad part of it, you know, I think one thing I'm interested in is the game times because from – Talking with different people, a lot of people feel like this is going to be a move that puts SMU a little bit more in that late afternoon primetime slot when it comes to home games because you don't want the Pac-12 league games to be starting at 9 a.m. local time out there on the West Coast. How many 11 o'clock games do factor in? Because when the Pac-12 is talking about trying to own a little bit more of a college football Saturday – what does that 11 a.m. kick mean to them? Is it enough to say, okay, for the first time, really, we're going to be you know, doing this 11 a.m. kickoff in a central time zone? What does that mean for the overall landscape of college football on a Saturday and the Pac-12 getting more buzz around their games? Is that something they explore with SMU because they can do it you know, at 11 a.m. central rather than trying those 9 a.m. Pacific time games that I believe they tried during COVID? Um, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, just a handful of them. But I'm interested to see how the time slots work out with this media rights deal um, when it comes to the Pac-12. And if SMU's in, is there anything that's surprising? And I would say if it was a surprise on some of those time slots, it would probably be a little bit more of a negative for SMU fans. Now, I'm in the boat that the Pac-12 is going to be able to be in a more reasonable time slot if SMU is in the Pac-12 at least once, uh, a you know, one game a, a week on that Saturday, that's where they can try to capitalize on it, especially when they are going to be streaming. They are going to have a little bit more um, leeway in terms of time slots, in my mind, when it comes to selecting when their games are played. So um, if, if we end up with a surprise that's bad, that would probably be it. As far as SMU... I think people are going to be surprised at how well SMU can recruit uh, in the Pac-12 because you look at what SMU is doing facility-wise, the buzz around the program with transfers, 
what they did in year one under Rhett Lashley, going to a bowl game, the first coach to do it since the 1980s. I think there's a, there's a good bit of momentum around SMU, and being in the Pac-12 kind of eliminates that last piece of the puzzle when it comes to, well, why not SMU? Well, they're not in a Power 5 conference. You know, there are some players out of high school that are very much in the boat that say, I can go anywhere and be successful, but there's just a little bit of that extra help in a Power 5 conference. That's now gone for SMU. So uh, that would be kind of a surprise is how well recruiting would go from the high school ranks, I would think, if SMU joins the Pac-12. On the bad side, I mean travel, but that's not really a, a, a surprise for SMU when it comes to this. Um, there's going to be money spent to you know, take their teams wherever they need to go. That's a good chunk of change. But I do feel like when it comes to the monetary side of things and having to travel like that, and I was talking with a couple friends about this this week, people are so excited about this. And if it did become official, it would be a game changer for a lot of fans. And it would be a game changer, I think, for some boosters that support the program and, and programs at a, at a moderate level. And they might want to get even more involved and support at a higher level. And that goes across the board at sports. And you toss in uh, an improved media rights deal share, even if SMU has to take less early on in the deal, which I do believe they're going to have to do. Um, all of those things would negate the negative of traveling that far and maybe how they have to travel uh, because then you'd have a little bit more money to do an extra charter, do a charter here or there for other sports, some of the non-revenue ones if they're going very far. So that's something that I would say would be the bad, would be a little bit of the travel, but then again, there's more money coming in and they'll be able to uh, handle travel a little bit better in some instances when it when it comes to that um, across the board uh, for SMU athletics. Um, and, you know, finally, um, this is a this is an interesting question and, and I'm trying to find it right now. And here it is. It comes in from Friar Wolf on the board. Um, the scenario is um, I'm athletic director. The Pac-12 has offered SMU a spot and the Big 12 picks up the phone and says, you have, you can join us, but you cap your shared percentage of the TV contract at 60% for the life of the contract you have until 5 p.m. I've been given full on autonomy to make this decision. And what would I do? I would say, um, I would say you take the Pac-12 deal. Uh, this is this is one where if you look at the Big 12 media deal, they've signed a six-year, $2.28 billion deal um, in 2022. That contract um, begins, I believe, this upcoming season. Um, and the number uh, per school is going to be $31.7 million. So if you get 60% for the life of that contract, it's about, call it $16 million a year for SMU. Now, the contract six years. So up in, what is that, 2028, 2029, um, that's going to be something where if you're taking, all right, the Big 12 deal will expire in 2031. Um, that is almost a decade uh, of of having to sit at that sixty uh, percent mark, I go with the Pac-12 deal. I, I think even if you have to sacrifice early on on that front, I don't think you you can do that necessarily long term. Even though if you got sixty percent right off the bat, you're probably getting more in the early stages of the Big Twelve deal than maybe you would if you were offered. Uh, a lower share, like 30, 40% in the early goings to kind of offset you coming in um, and keep other schools happy. And then, you know, in the back half of the deal, it kicks into the full price. I don't think that um, necessarily plays as well. I think 60% for the life of the contract for almost a decade, um, that's, that's not something I would go for. Um, it would double your revenue when you look at the Pac-12. 
if they can get around $30 million um, right at or right below the Big 12, then you're looking at a deal where SMU maybe has to take 50% the first two years. And then from there, they have that full full price. Then you're cooking with gas a little bit as far as revenue coming in. Um, I would still go with the Pac-12. And, and, you know, I think this is a unique play for SMU. Uh, if they're able to do it, I think it sets them apart. Um, and, you know, the Big 12 has is, is always kind of thrown their noses up at, at SMU. So um, I, would, I would still pick the Pac-12 deal. And I feel like if that call was made to SMU right now, they would probably do the same. Um, just a gut, just a hunch on that one there, though. So that wraps up the mailbag portion of the podcast, as well as some thoughts on the Pac-12 media rights deal. Now we head into a little bit of spring preview action here for SMU. Mustangs now just a week away from opening spring ball on March 2nd. We'll be out there for full coverage from ontheponyexpress.com. So subscribe. We've got a special coming up for those who are looking to subscribe. So um, be on the lookout for that on the first day of spring practice on Thursday. It's a great time to jump on board with spring ball and the Pac-12 realignment happening. When it comes to the spring's most important position battles, and what I mean by this is, look, you look at the left guard spot, for example. Well, Logan Parr doesn't get here until the summer. Ja'Kai Clark doesn't get here for this until the summer. Same goes for the center position uh, with Branson Hickman. They've got Ben Sparks at left guard right now. That's a position that'll be settled a little bit more so in the summer um, and in fall camp. And we'll see that position battle rage on once those guys get here. When it comes to the here and now, I look at number one on my list, the running back position. And I think Jalen Knighton is going to win the starting job. Don't get me wrong. But you have LJ Johnson, who's impressed. They both impressed during spring workouts so far. But look, you have Kamar Wheaton, a very very highly touted player coming back. He showed some flashes last year. How does he look in spring ball? One thing to note with this position battle is I would expect Tyler Levine to be out for the spring. He had a knee uh, knee uh, surgery done. Um, and so I think he's somebody that could be held out. We haven't gotten that confirmed yet, but it wouldn't shock me if he was at least very much um, – you know, put in bubble wrap and, and kind of protected uh, as he gets close to playing his final season of college football. That'll give even more reps to some of the running backs uh, in the mix as well for that starting job. And I just feel like when you look at that group, you have Kamar Wheaton coming back off of a off of some flashes of, of what could be for him. Um, you have Velton Gardner, who started out uh, very well uh, his SMU career, but he's got uh, you know, he had some injuries uh, cleaned up late in the year. Um, you even have Roger Daniels, who was put back there at running back, but he's probably going back to his natural position at slot. Uh, you have veterans like Brandon Brandon Epton, who's been around a while now. He just hasn't gotten a shot. Zane Miners, a former, former walk-on. Does Monte Dawson, a gadget guy, factor in at all? Um, but what you do have is LJ Johnson, uh, Jalen Knighton, and Kamar Wheaton, and Velton Gardner really set to battle it out. I mean, that is a, a four, a group of four that, I mean, I, we haven't seen this at SMU in, I mean, since the 1980s. I mean, this level of at least football talent in the backfield is really impressive. And there have been good running backs that have, that have come through SMU. I mean, that when, when Xavier Jones, Braden West, and um, I think Ulysses Bentley was, was a freshman coming on and, and, you know, we've seen spurts of it. Um, and obviously, Zach Line was a workhorse for years. But to have that group, I mean, three former top 100 prospects in the same backfield, um, this is a really, really talented group that has a lot to prove uh, going into this spring. Um, and, and somebody's going to be trying to, to stake their claim to the starting job early on. And they're all here. They're all ready to work out. You know what you're getting with Tyler Levine when he gets back. Um, so now it's time to roll the ball out and see who takes off right away. I look at Jalen Knighton as a starter. Um, I just think what he can do catching the football, his production uh, it, at the major college football level is there. Uh, but uh, Kamar Wheaton is going to have something to say. LJ Johnson is 
highly motivated um, to get into a bigger role now that he's at SMU. And Belton Gardner is a little slept on. So we saw what he could do when he broke off that long touchdown run against UCF. Um, but we just need to see more from him. So it's a big spring for that whole group. I think the competition is outstanding at that position. So that's my number one group that I'm watching. The other is the safety position. And this is a group uh, that when you factor in Jonathan McGill, you factor in CJ Sanders potentially as, as a guy who can maybe play some nickel. Um, you look at what they've brought in in that group. And I just think it's it's now a, a position where, all right, how does everyone fit in? Um, because you did bring in, you know, two guys in Jonathan McGill and CJ Sanders uh, that you certainly look at as starters in all likelihood. And then does Jalen Davis Robinson factor in there at all? But um, he looks like a, you know, cornerback for the future. Um, Bryce McMorris, what happens to him now that he's back off that knee injury? Is he going to move to safety? And then you have the returners. You have Ahmad Moses. You have Brian Massey. Uh, you have Brandon Crossley at nickel. Um, Scott Simons and Kyle Cooper taking over that position group now. I think this is a group that um, is going to be highly competitive. It's it's a group that has a bright future with Ahmad Moses. Um, Jonathan McGill has two years left. Uh, CJ Sanders has multiple years left. And then you have the guys that are coming back um, and have something to prove. You have a Brian Massey uh, who certainly had a year that he would probably like to forget. I mean, losing his starting job by the end of it uh, to Ahmad Moses, who really looks like, again, a, a, a really key player for SMU in the future. Does Isaiah Wachovia come in and try to stake a claim back uh, to a safety spot? Uh, that's something I'm watching for as well. And, you know, I just feel like it's one of the most competitive groups on the team. And when you look at that group, you look at the corner room um, for, for Ricky Hunley, you have Charles Woods and Chris Meganson who are uh, day one starters. I mean, if you look at it for SMU, I mean, they just bring so much to the table. But then you have guys coming back like Tavares Hall, um, Jahari Rogers, um, Sam Westfall, I believe, is, is coming back um, and still on the roster. And then you have Jalen Davis Robinson, who's here as well. And don't sleep on A.J. Davis. And, and look, the staff, uh, when they were up there for National Signing Day, you know, they were, you know, Ricky Hunley kind of raved about the work A.J. Davis has done. This is somebody that could stake a claim um, to, you know, very well being in the two deep um, by the end of spring. And I think they have that high hopes for him. So um, this, this is in the spring going to be a position that could very well not necessarily be settled, but I look at the the cornerback room as one that's highly competitive with two transfers coming in, as well as some returners that are going to try to stake their claim to it as well. Uh, another room that I'm watching closely is the linebacker room. Ahmad Walker walks in as a probable day one starter, but then you get into, all right, Alex Kilgore, you were brought in as an early enrollee to be given a chance uh, to, um, you know, come in and, and start early. And he's got the size, he's got the physicality, he's got the athleticism. But Cam Farrar, Jaquandis Burns, Kiki Burns, um, Pierre Goree's back uh, for another year. What does that room look like at the spot opposite of Ahmad Walker? Uh, that's something that I'm very intrigued by. Um, and then, of course, this summer, you'll add in Brandon Miazano, but I'm watching Alex Kilgore. That is like one of the top guys that I want to see in action right away. Um, how does he look? How is he adjusting? Uh, how is he processing? Because if Alex Kilgore unlocks his full potential by the time game one rolls around, uh, at least for you know grabbing a starting job and, and being you know a starter as a true freshman, I think that's a very important piece to this defense is who lines up next to Ahmad Walker. And if it's Alex Kilgore and he's shown that much, that's a good thing, in my opinion, because he is that talented. And you have some guys coming back that have played a lot of ball um, over the last couple uh, last couple seasons now um, and, and played a good bit and came on strong last year. Jaquandis Burns did that. 
um, as they played behind that group of you know three veterans with Jimmy Phillips, Shannon Reed, and Isaac Slade Matotia. So uh, the linebacker room is another piece that I'm watching. And then after that, uh, this wide receiver group. I'll flip back over for the last the last position I'm really watching. Um, this wide receiver group. They add Keyshawn Smith. They add Romello Brinson into the fold. Um, they'll get you know their high school signees on campus this summer, but that almost allows for Jordan Curley, Jake Bailey, Moochie Dixon, Teddy Knox, you know, to battle it out with these guys, um, you know, coming back. Dylan Goffney, if he's ready for the spring. You've got Jackson Lavender on campus uh, now as one of the high school signees. How do Keyshawn Smith and Romello Brinson look when they're back in the offense that they had some success in under Rhett Lashley when he was at Miami? And how did they push? Guys like Jordan Curley, who's already added 10 pounds from what Casey Woods told us um, at the National Signing Day event. Jake Bailey, how does he look now that he's back off of his injury? Um, Moochie Dixon came on really strong at the end of last year, I felt like. And then you have Roderick Daniels in the slot, too. Um, this is a group that we, over the last couple years, and you take out Rasheed Rice because he's so dominant, but it's a group over the last couple years with these guys on campus that they haven't necessarily been able to stay healthy. And it's kind of gotten to the point where is this the year? Is this the year that they all stay healthy? And SMU has its full complement of receivers, you know, let's say almost all year. And odds are there's going to be injuries. There's, it's going to happen. But if they can stay healthy, they do have the talent to make life easy on Preston Stone um, at quarterback. And, um, the pecking order and the positioning of them is what I'm intrigued to see when it comes to that wide receiver group. I expect Jordan Curley. I expect Jake Bailey um, to and Keyshawn Smith to kind of be that top three. But somebody in spring is going to have some say about all that. Could it be Roger Daniels? Could it be Dylan Goffney? Um, could it be uh, Moochie Dixon? You know, those are all guys that I'm circling and, and want to see more out of. You know, what what can they bring to the table um, when it comes down to making a push to be a starter uh, at wide receiver for SMU? So um, it, there's competition at that in that room across the board at really all three positions for the wide receiver spots. You know, can can Roger Daniels push Jake Bailey? Can Jackson Lavender make some noise there? Um, you have who are the true outside guys? You know, you've got Jordan Curley. You've got Keyshawn Smith. That looked to be an outside guy. Um, you know, does Dylan Goffney push outside Moochie Dixon? These are all things that I'm going to be watching for the wide receiver room. So those are five position groups uh, out of all of them that I'm watching for when it comes to competition in spring ball. We're a week away. We'll have a lot more spring preview content to come. We, of course, have um, one of our uh, spring position previews coming on Friday. We're going to take a look at the wide receivers and tight ends more in depth. Uh, and kind of reset things on how that group looks overall. Uh, so be on the lookout for that before we finish up next week with our spring position preview podcast with the linebacker room uh, as Maurice Crum takes over that position um, as he is, an, you know, the new addition to the staff on the defensive side of the ball. So with that, guys, hope you enjoyed this edition of the podcast. A lot of ground covered. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are closing in on now 700 subscribers well over half of you guys that listen, don't subscribe to the channel. Please do us a favor, help us out, and click that subscribe button. We need it uh, more than uh, almost as much as we need SMU uh, in the Pac-12. So with that, guys, we're going to shut down this edition of the podcast. Hope you guys enjoyed it and have a great rest of the week. We'll check in on Friday with another SMU Spring Football Preview Podcast. Thanks for listening and have a good one.